everybody. It is just about 11 a.m. here in the beautiful Garden State of New Jersey on a Wednesday, so that must mean we are here for our hour animal update. As always, uh, my name is Fred. I'm the director of guest programs here at the uh, Liberty Science Center. Behind the camera is always Depesh. Hello. If anyone has any questions as we go about our animal update, you can send them in to Depesh. And also, as always, we have Mickey joining us at the beginning today. But we're not in our normal place for anyone who uh, joins us regularly for our animal updates. Knows that we always start uh, visiting our friend Mickey, seeing what he's up to. But we're usually not in this location. That's because today we're going to be visiting our marine animals, our underwater animals, up in our, our Hudson home gallery. But we, of course, want to see what Mickey up to and the ever popular Nicole is Nicole. Today. Nicole is here. Nicole is here. Uh, and if anyone has any questions about Mickey or any questions for Nicole while we have her here for the first few minutes of our animal update about what it's like to, to work in animal husbandry, what it's like to uh, be an animal keeper. And I'm sorry, I know we're having to like scan back and forth here, but we're doing our best to make sure we're being responsible and doing our social distancing. Also, let us know if we're not loud enough. Uh, it's a little louder up here than it is downstairs, so I'm trying to talk real loud, but uh, let us know if, if I still need to scream even louder. Uh, I'll also give you all a heads up. You may hear some banging throughout. We're doing a little roof repair today here at the Science Center. A lot of you can probably relate to that. A lot of you, I'm sure, have been at home doing some of those <laughs> DIY projects. You've uh, been hoping to get to for a very, very long time. So we're doing the same thing here. All right. Uh, about, are we getting any questions or maybe even we're getting some telling us where they're from? Yeah, yeah we're getting from uh, Hillsboro. Rox, Roxy says hi. Karen says hi from Hillsboro. Uh, let's see. We're getting a lot of hellos. Reno uh, says hi. Who does? Reno. Reno. How are yeah. you going, Reno? Yeah. So for anyone who is, is new to our animal update, Mickey is our green-winged macaw. He is uh, about 39 years old. And they can live up to about 70 years old. So he has a long, long way to go. He is the world's second largest uh, macaw. Not him, but the green-winged macaw. Second only to the hyacinth macaw. They can get to be about three feet long. And if he decides to open up those wings, you'll see that very impressive wingspan of up to three and a half feet. Uh, someone has a question for Nicole already. They want to know, what is Nicole's animal training experience? Um, I worked, mostly I started training parrots. Um, Mickey's, I mean, he's trained enough to be on my arm, um, but I started training parrots um, with like voluntary clipping their nails, um, I worked with uh, free flighted parrots, so um, flying A to B's, which is like one point to another. Um, and then I also worked with training some goats and pigs. Um, and then I came here. And currently, um, my big training project right now here is working with our cotton top tamarins to get them to voluntarily go in a kennel, um, which is on their own, um, in case they need to go to the vet for a checkup or anything. Um, they have the choice to go in the kennel. And go to the vet. Why, why is it so important that, why can't you just pick up the tamarind and put them in the kennel? Why is it so important to train them to be able to do that? So training animals um, gives them pretty much the choice to do what they want to do. Um, we use a technique called positive reinforcement. So um, I know, you know, we want them to go in the kennel, but if they were to do it, um, that's when we give them something they really like. Um, I use mealworms because they find the mealworms very reinforcing. They really like those. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> oh, ho, ho. Yep, that happened. That's an expensive map, too. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so the tamarins really like the mealworms, so it's just kind of pairing something they really like with a behavior that would be uh, beneficial to us and them. It might stress them out if we were to just pick them up and put them in a kennel themselves. So in the aspect of training, it's really beneficial because, one, it builds that trust between you and the animal. You're not just making them go somewhere. They have that choice to do it. Um, and it's also beneficial for husbandry practices. Um, like I said, in case we need to do anything like vet procedures, um, they have a choice in participating in that. 
All right. If you were, <clears throat> as someone who works in animal husbandry every single day, what, what do you spend most of your day doing? What is, what is the big parts of the day in the life of an animal keeper? Cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly cleaning. Um, as yep. you see, we've had We're him gonna... out for, I don't even, like, probably less than five minutes, and he's already made a mess up here. <laughs> um, so a lot of the day is spent cleaning. Um, cleanliness is really beneficial to the animal's health. Um, it's an indicator that um, they're being well cared for, and also if they're not well cared for, it can cause um, some other issues. So we spend a lot of the time cleaning, and then I would say the next busiest part is feeding. Um, so we have a lot of animals... Uh, so they all need to be fed. Um, some, not every day, like the invertebrates, the scorpion we saw a few weeks ago, they only get fed once a week, but someone like Mickey gets fed uh, once a day, and then the tamarins, I know, you want to talk too, uh, the tamarins <laughs> get fed twice every day. Um, so I would say cleaning, and then feeding. And so, then enrichment and fun stuff too. So, mm. and, and that was going to lead me to my next question, <laughs> what is the most rewarding part of working with animals every day? Um, I'll give an example. So watching an animal interact with their enrichment is something that I find very rewarding. Um, the naked morats, just as an example, are specifically my favorite because their natural behavior is digging and tunneling. So that leaves the door open for lots of different uh, enrichment opportunities that can have them exhibit that natural behavior that they would be doing um, underground in Africa. Um, so it's really rewarding to see an animal interact with the enrichment you give them and exhibit those natural behaviors. And I also, not right now because we're closed, but I love the opportunity for guests to be able to see the animals interacting with the enrichment because they also get to see, one, that the animals are well cared for, and two, um, they get to see some of those natural behaviors in action. Hello. So, I, obviously everybody who's tuning in, and hopefully everyone, we're getting even more and more people. Oh, everyone yeah. send us in your questions. We're getting a lot of highs and hellos from well, all over New Jersey, tour of our Canada, and some of our Pennsylvania, the water animals here shortly. Uh, but South just, Brunswick. While we have the wonderful Nicole here, um, everyone who's tuning in must have an interest in animals because that's why they're tuning in. And there might even be some people at home who are wondering how they might one day be able to have uh, a career in animal husbandry. So Nicole, what advice would you give to anyone at home who would maybe one day want to work in animal husbandry? Get started as soon as you can. Uh, spend lots of time volunteering and doing internships uh, to get that experience with animals or even just being around um, other people that are caring for animals. Um, having that experience is something that's very important uh, later when you try to get a job uh, working with animals full time. Um, so I would say for our, our younger crowd, definitely spend that time uh, volunteering and getting internships. Even if it's even if one day you want to work with a parrot, a green wing macaw like Mickey, um, I started out volunteering at humane societies with cats and dogs. Um, so any kind of experience you can get uh, doing that would be very beneficial for this career. All right. We're getting a lot of hellos from people, uh, but they also want to hear Mickey talk. Uh, you want to talk? <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you can hear how well like people at home can hear, but while I was talking a lot, he was like a little chattering. Um, so not speaking English like me, um, but speaking parrot, he was doing a little bit of chatter. More so than what he's doing now. Uh. So if anyone at home speaks macaw, he's talking right now. Uh, he's not using his English words. Um, so Mickey has the ability to uh, say some human English words. He is not, uh, he doesn't do it as much as maybe some other parrots do, maybe like an African gray parrot. He does have the ability to say his name. I know he says hello. Uh, what other, does he have a few other favorite words, Nicole? The other day, for the first time, I heard him say what? <laughs> and um, <laughs> he gets really excited and he's on his perch and I'm like talking to him. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so he actually said that the other day, not while I was saying it to him, but I was putting him back um, on his perch with some new enrichment. So uh -huh. that must have been something he associated with being stimulated and excited. Um, sometimes when the phone rings in um, our animal care center where he is, um, he's heard the phone ring and I've heard him say hello before, okay. before we say it. Um, so I would say hello, his name, what, and he does 
like an evil person laugh, so like a ha ha ha. <laughs> That would be fun to watch. He's doing on cue, but he, he has that ability, but he definitely makes lots yeah. of sounds. He's making, you can hear at home, he's making some sounds now. Yeah. Uh, if you've been on any of our previous sound updates, you know he can also get very, very loud. Mm -hmm. He can actually scream at over 100 decibels, which is mm. the equivalent of, say, a snowmobile or a motorcycle. Uh, and where he would be from in the wild in South America, in the tropical forest, he needs to be that loud in order to... Uh, have his voice heard through the very thick vegetation. Right. I think we're gonna we're gonna say uh, uh, thank you and goodbye to Nicole and Mickey, and we're gonna start our tour of our huts and home. Thank you so much for joining us, both of you. Thank you guys. Have <laughs> fun with the fish. All right. All right, we're gonna go as Nicole said. We're gonna check out some fish. So come on into our huts and home. Now, our Hudson home is a gallery all about the Hudson River, and the Hudson River is America's, is considered America's first river. So we're about 315 miles long, and the gallery we're about to enter shows the relationship between the millions and millions of people who live and work around the river every day, the animals and plants that call the river home, and of course the physical river itself. And we have some very large uh, aquaria, or tanks or aquaria, we're going to visit our first one, and we're going to kind of work our way up the river. So this is our open harbor tank. This aquarium here wow. holds 7,000 gallons what? of water. 7,000 7, gallons. gallons. So, so if you have, if you open your refrigerator, you don't have to go do that right now, and open it up and you see you have a gallon of milk, this is the equivalent of 7,000 of those. In this tank here. And we can now put this water in the harbor. Anyone who knows where Liberty Science Center is knows that we're very close to the harbor here, but we actually make our own salt water here. We're right now on the first floor. Oh, can oh hear him. Mickey in the back. I can hear him. Wait, let's go, let's see him leave. Oh there oh there's Nicole again. As they make their very subtle <laughs> Yeah, very subtle. Very subtle. Always high. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and we have a new person. Hey, we have Samantha. Samantha <laughs> is our aquarist here. And she's the one who takes care of all the fish. And she's going to be feeding some fish today. And for the fish we have here, give you a view of what, what's on the menu for today. Mm, scrumptious. We have some delicious squid. Mm -hmm. We have some capelin, which is a kind of fish. All right. We have a smaller kind of fish, which is a silver side. And... We have some delicious clam. Wow. Yummy, right? Exactly wow. what you want to eat and smell first thing in the morning. I can smell I'm it. Sure, I'm sure can Samantha's, definitely very, smell it. Samantha's very used to it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to hand over this, this wonderful tray of food here to Samantha because I bet our fish want that. And she's going to head up there and get ready to feed our fish. In the meantime, I'll tell you a little bit more about this tank. Like I was saying, we uh, actually take our own and mix our own salt water here and we pump it up into these tanks. We make so much each year that we go through 14 tons of salt to make what? our salt water. 14 what? tons of salt. In How order did I not know this? Salt water we need for I don't, our tanks. I also did not know this, guys, and I work here. <laughs> we, have, we have a few different species of fish in here, but we'll talk about them in a moment after we get them eating. So, this is showing the harbor portion of uh, the habitat of the Hudson River. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Harbor. Millions of people work there every day. A lot of different animals live in this part of the river. It's also the deepest part of the river, up to about 50 feet deep. And a, it's a very commercial. We have someone up there. Billion dollars worth of stuff, of uh, products, come through the New York, New Jersey Harbor every year. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of action going on in the harbor. And I don't think everyone always thinks about what's happening below the surface of the water mm -hmm. with some of our different fish. So I think Samantha is just about ready. Okay. We, we, won't keep, we won't keep everyone in suspense, so we're going to, she's going to drop some of that food in for our fish. Whoa. We're very excited. Oh, look at that. That is, that is awesome. That yeah, is bit, awesome. A a fish feeding frenzy going yeah, on. that never gets old. Yep. There we go. He grabbed it. He grabbed it. Oh, there's still it, so it much. It's definitely not too early in the morning for our fish. Yeah, and they just suck it up, right? So, like, are they chewing it? What are they doing? Yeah, so 
Uh, the big fish in here are these guys. These guys are the black drum. Okay. So the black drum have rows and rows of almost peg-like looking teeth inside their mouth. There's another black drum. And they're really good at crushing. So oh, they wow. do chew it because what they like to eat is it. so they love grab things it. like clams. Yeah, grab it. Deep in the uh, that are buried in the mud and the sand, and they suck them up out of the sand, and then they smash the shells together. So they they have very very powerful bites, and they're called black drum because they have uh, an organ in their body called a swim bladder that helps them with their buoyancy, and they're actually able to make a very loud bass like drum like sound. With There's one. That swim bladder. So that's why they're called black drum. And how big do they get? They are the, or they will be, these guys are actually nowhere close to full grown. They'll get quite a bit bigger. But the black drum can get up to nearly six feet long and weigh over a hundred pounds. So our, our black drum here are nowhere near that size yet. 100 pounds. You know what? Really That's almost as heavy as me. Much, much bigger. <laughs> And then the other fish you're seeing a lot of in here, uh, if you have in any aqu a freshwater aquarium at home, maybe you, you think those are like angelfish or something like that, right? They're called permit. Permits, yeah, they're they are. another large fish. Sorry, I'm they zoom out. They're about, some of these guys are about as long as they're going to get, but they can get pretty heavy themselves. That's one. Maybe not 100 pounds, but up to maybe like 80 pounds, our permit can get. And you'll see that they have a Almost like that classic what you would think of like an angel fish body. We're gonna talk a little bit about fish body shape. That is called a compressed body shape. So they're compressed like a like a pancake, but vertically. And the reason why a fish might want to have a body like that is it means they can be very fast in the short bursts, mm -hmm. but it also makes them very maneuverable. So they're able to turn on a dive really fast. And usually, if you see fish like that, it's fish that are living around reefs and shipwreck shipwrecks and underwater structures, and that's exactly where permit like to live. And you can see in here, we even have some reef balls. Okay. And that would be a habitat that permit love to be around. So we're getting a question about, are these um, edible? Are these edible? Yes, I, I don't believe they are the most popular fish for eating. Um, I know people do eat drum fish, usually not black drum, but I, I do believe they're edible uh, as our firm. But I don't think they're very, I, I myself am not a seafood connoisseur, <laughs> but I do not believe they're among the more popular fish to be eating. There is a, a, a very popular sports fish in here, and that is our blue fish. Oh, that's it right there. That's the yeah. guy. It's one of them. And they can get up to be about three feet long. And anyone who likes to go fishing, there he is. Uh, and that's a that is definitely a fish Whoa. that you. Uh, that's a really good fighter. I know people really love to uh, try and go out for bluefish. He's excited. They are very powerful, voracious predators. And you can see he has a not a uh, like that compressed body shape. He has almost like a torpedo body, almost yeah. like you would think of a, a dolphin or a shark. And that is called fusy form body shape. And that Can you say that again? Fusy form. Fusy form. There, there's a, one of our vocab words for the day. Yeah, and fusy form. It's a, a, a body shape like a torpedo that lets a fish go really fast for a really long period of time. So if, you, if you're a predatory fish and you want to chase after something, you want to have that torpedo shaped body so that you don't have a lot of drag and you're able to chase your food. Mm. And bluefish are very, very voracious predators. In there fact, he is again. They're known to even to attack entire schools of fish and to keep attacking them even after they're full. That's how strong their hunting instinct is. And I know everybody at home, if you join this lake, please send in any questions you might have. We're gonna be visiting all of our marine animals today okay. in our uh, Hudson Home ga Gallery, our, our gallery that has all of our, kind of our aquarium set up. And we're going to be visiting so, two more tanks after this. And we're also going to feed them all the animals at every tank, too. So we're getting a question about the feeding. That's a good question. How many times do they feed a day? Only once. Only once? Only once. So fish, they're cold-blooded. They're not like us. They don't need those three square meals and uh, maybe some snacks in between like we do. They're cold-blooded animals, so they don't require nearly so much food. And actually, I, I bet anyone, probably a lot of people at home probably have an aquarium. And you know it's actually really easy to overfeed 
your fist. Oh, you have yeah. To be careful, if anything, that you don't overfeed your fish. That's happened to me. So, you can see we have, a, we have quite a number of large fish in here. It was probably hard to see just how much uh, food Samantha dumped in there. But it wasn't all that much compared to the number of fish. Uh, just maybe a few pounds or so of food. I'm zooming on this guy. And that's because they're cold-blooded animals. They don't need to eat quite like warm-blooded animals like us do. Yeah. So they are they are from the Hudson River. This yeah. is from the Hudson River. Do we um, ever release them back into the Hudson River? No, we, we don't do release uh, of our animals out into, into the river. Um, sometimes they may not spend their entire lives here. They may go somewhere else, but they they don't get just released out into the, into the ocean. Uh, once they're here, it's really healthier for them to be here. They get very well taken care of. As they've got the wonderful Samantha coming by and throwing some food in for them. They're getting mm -hmm. excellent care. Uh, so and they're, they're very well cared for and have nice, healthy, long lives here. So we, we don't really need to ever release them. That might not be the best thing for them. But it's really great that they're here to uh, be able to educate us and lots of people about the environment around us because this is right outside our window. This, if you were, if you live near the Hudson River, this could be right now going on right outside your window and you might not even know it. That so there are, there are these animals out there. So people are asking um, the harmony in the tank. It seems like you were talking about the bluefish being predatorial, mm -hmm. um, you know, the drumfish having like very powerful jaws. How are they just like getting along? So our these are fish that have been, the husbandry staff here is, well, I'm sorry, I'm tripping all over my words. You can always tell, anyone at home, on every, every Wednesday, you can always tell if I've had my coffee yet. I, I, Next time we should my, just have a coffee break. Yeah, we'll have our, we'll our five-minute coffee break halfway in. Um, so our husbandry staff spends a lot of time researching the fish that they're putting together. They want to make sure that these are fish that can coexist. Definitely the size of the fish that are going in, so you might have species of fish that might might be able to be together, but if they're not in the similar size range, you might have a problem. And definitely another big part of it is, our fish are very well fed. There's mm -hmm. no need for them to go around attacking one another because, again, that Samantha comes by, throws in wonderful uh, silver sides and clam and, and squid for them, and there's really no need, they're very full. Um, and. and well cared for. There's really no need for them to be looking for extra snacks. Okay. So we're getting a lot of questions about uh, how many fish there are in the tank. It's really hard to tell, but there are uh, three different species, yes? So three, there's the... Three different species. Let's do a quick count here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'd say there's about a dozen fish in here. In our a dozen 7, fish. And 7,000 gallons. And 26 different species of animal in our Hudson home. And actually, why don't, why don't we go to the next tank? Let's do it. All right, let, let's go to the next one. Let's so get one more shot of this one guy. Last look at our you guys can tank. see what I look like because <laughs> now yeah, I have a reflection. A sneak peek of, uh, <laughs> of Depeche. Anyone who joins us for our trivia Thursday nights and Friday mornings knows Depeche well. Yep. He's our trivia, trivia quiz person. master. So we've got uh, so the permits. Uh, let me get you guys the black drum. That's the black drum right there. And behind him is the bluefish. The bluefish. Right there. The bluefish can get to be about three feet long. They can get to be about 40 pounds. All right. He's probably, he's getting there. He's not full grown. All right, now we're going we're gonna to head to our next tank for Aquaria, which is our salt marsh tank. And hey, there's Samantha here. again. She's like a magic trick, she just appears. She just appears. <laughs> oh, wow, we okay. Some more, of course, we want to see what's on the menu. So, Here. we're in a smaller tank now, right? We're in a smaller tank with smaller fish, so smaller wow. food. So, some of this is food that we just had in our open harbor tank, like our uh, silver sides here and bits of maybe shrimp or uh, bits of uh, clam or squid, but just chopped up smaller. But we're also now adding krill. So that's Great these uh, little guys here, little shrimp looking guys. Those are our krill. We're gonna hand those back over to Samantha. And this is our, our salt marsh tank. And this is a bit smaller than our other tank. It has 
only about 2,300 gallons of water, which is quite a lot of still. I would wow. Say. Okay, so you might have to come like at the six foot line with me here because it's getting a little louder. Getting a little loud. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna flip over here. I'm on this side. And actually, wow. Samantha has a, a little bit of a treat for us. So after she feeds some of our fish here, she's going to be doing some target feeding target with feeding. our terrapins. Oh, and wow. Well, so here she comes. She's gonna throw that food in. There's Samantha, by the way. This is the big tank right here. Giving you guys a little bit of context. It's our salt marsh tank. So this is an environment that called an, or a type of estuary, which is a place where you're getting fresh water and salt water mixing together. There's the terrapin. Salt marshes are really important habitats for lots of animals. See, she's got that target in there. And we can see one of our, our terrapins swimming towards the target. Oh, I see Actually, it. Actually, we see, we see more than one. Wow, yeah, they're going straight for that stuff, right at that target. Yeah, they saw that target, and that's, I bet, a really great way for Samantha to, to make sure that all of the terrapins are getting exactly the type of food, or the amount of food, because if she just threw it in there, she doesn't know who's eating what. That's a good point. Yeah, this a is very a good, good way point. to make sure everyone's getting their food and knowing how much they're eating. We have, these are diamondback terrapins. Let's back up and talk about the terrapins. Yeah. We're, we're getting some great terrapin action right now. So these are diamondback terrapins and we have three of them. Yes, they have names and yes, I know them. So <laughs> they, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Sylvia, we've got Rachel, Anna, and Sylvia. There we go. So we got all three of their names. They are the only animals that have names this week in our Hudson home. But I know everybody at home loves to know their names. There's Samantha feeding them. So diamondback terrapins, you might ask, well, what's the difference between a terrapin and a turtle? Well, terrapins are types of turtles. Uh, a turtle would be considered a terrapin if it spends a lot of its time or most of its time in brackish water. So brackish water is that mix of fresh water and salt water. And actually the diamondback terrapin is the only turtle in North America that spends its entire life in brackish water. And it might even be the only one in the world. It definitely is in North America. Oh, we got an intruder. We got an intruder. We'll get to him in a second. Okay. Let's talk, let's finish up with our terrapins though, because there's yeah. a lot to talk about with them. So we have our three girls in here. Mm -hmm. And the girls get quite a bit bigger than the boys. So we know these are girls. You could, if you know your diamondback terrapins, you'd be able to tell these are girls immediately because they are quite a bit bigger than the boys. They can get um, at least up to nine inches long, if not a little bit bigger, our female terrapins. While the boys, they rarely get up over six inches long. So there's a big difference between the male and the female terrapins. Unfortunately for diamondback terrapins, they're uh, a species in New Jersey that's considered threatened. Oh no. And there's a couple reasons why. And one long, long time ago, 100 years ago, at the beginning of the 1900s, they were collected often. A lot of them were collected, believe it or not, for food. People used to make turtle soup out of them. Mm. That's not something, of course, we do anymore. But diamondback terrapins still face a lot of uh, dangers. Certainly motorboat strikes are an issue for them. Uh, they tend to really like a lot of the food and bait used for, cra for people who uh, go crabbing. So sometimes they get stuck in crab traps, which can be fatal to them and another really big problem for them is habitat loss especially roads so they even though they like to spend lots of their time in the water the females or the girls have to come up in order to lay their eggs and sometimes we have now built roads where they have to cross to our box turtle and our american toad it, it's not so easy for a small a, a small slow animal to get out of the way of a car, so unfortunately cars are also a big danger for these guys, even though they spend a lot of their time underwater. So we're getting a question, so the questions we're getting are, how long does it take to train them for target train uh, feeding, and secondly, why diamondback? So they have a bit of a diamondback pattern on them, uh, or diamond-like pattern, so that's where, that's where that comes from. As far as how long it takes, I don't know, but I know someone who does know. Samantha, how, how long did it take to target train our Diamondback Terrapins? 
about a month. About a month. Anyone who wasn't able to hear, she said about a month for the oh, terrapins. Yeah, they are. She also mentioned that the burfish is trained, and it only took two days to train the burfish. Why don't we? Why don't we talk about those burfish? Where is that burfish? There he is. We have one over there, and we have actually another one going to the target. Oh. Over by Samantha. Okay. And those are striped. Burfish. I think I'm getting a better shot with this guy, so I'm gonna come over here. Now, striped burfish, that, that is, might be oh, a, a strange away. animal hey, to come see back, in a salt come box, back. but the, that one there, especially, that's a young striped burfish, and salt marshes act as nurseries for lots of young fish. They're, there's lots of food, they're relatively protected rather than being out in the open ocean. So, an animal like the striped burfish might wanna come here as a juvenile in order to grow up, because that okay. our burfish get quite a bit larger than that little guy there. They could get up to at least like, a foot long. He looks like he's smiling. <laughs> and he is he might be considered a type of puffer fish. So he's covered in those spines, but when threatened, he can suck water into his body and inflate himself two to three times Come his back. normal size. Come back. So that he does he becomes way more than a mouthful for a lot of predators. So maybe they can't get his, their mouth around him. And then with those added uh, spines there, he might be way more trouble than he's worth. And that's oh, how they now they're themselves. together. Oh, they just collided with each other. Now we were talking about body shape before. So you might say, well, what body shape is a, is a striped burfish? And it, he's got a bit of an unfortunate name. That body shape is called globby form. Globby form. Globby form. A globby yeah. form is basically just a, a name for any fish who have unusual body shapes. They're usually very slow. Where'd he go? He went, he went that oh. way. He's way past the <laughs> <Where's dead. he> <laughs> But Even though he's slow, he's evading the pest. I know. He's... And he doesn't need to be fast because he has that amazing puffing ability to protect himself. Mm. We have a lot of other fish in here too because salt marshes are home to lots of different animals, lots of different fish. At different stages of their lives, in fact, lots of animals in salt marshes oh. are temporary residents. They so, come and go. So uh, a big question is obviously he puffs up. What makes these uh, these fish puff up? So he sucks water into his body. So he doesn't use air; it's water, and he inflates himself. Okay. And then when he later on, once the dangerous pass, he can just spit it out. Interesting. Yeah. So we're getting, oh, there he is again. I guess he's, so the turtles, uh, would they eat these fish or do the turtles eat the fish? Again, like the same question as last time, uh, the harmony in the How tank. So and it's the same thing. These are uh, animals that would be, um, have been chosen Here's to live turtle. together in this uh, tank. There he is. With the understanding that we believe that they'll get along, especially because they're receiving so much uh, food regularly. There's really no need for them to chase one another. Uh, our terrapins certainly could eat some of the smaller fish in here. They really typically don't because they're well fed. There's really no need for them to hunt. We can take a look at some of the some of the bigger fish back there, and they have almost like a, here this big guy coming along here. Oh yeah, he's a striped mullet. Striped mullet. mullet. Okay. Striped mullet. And if I don't get a haircut soon, I'm gonna have a brown <laughs> mullet here in another week or so. Um, Where's he? Where's he? Go? So oh, there he, he is. Says he's a striped mullet, and he's about full grown. That's about as big as they get, about a, Whoa, he's a quick. foot and a half. And he likes to eat very small food, so he eats planktons and things like that. And he, they're really important to the environment because lots of algae and stuff grows on the sand, and they like to come along and, and suck up the sand, almost like a vacuum cleaner, yeah. and they sift out the microscopic food, that's and then right they there. spit out the sand. Oh, and that's almost like how they... Uh, how the sand and the sediment is is kept healthy by animals like that. Almost like if you had a garden and you went and turned over the topsoil. It's there basically what our burf, our uh, not our burfish, our mullet are doing. Mm. So it seems like he has that very torpedo-like shape as well, right? Yes. So any purpose of that? Is he also a predator style? So he's he's not necessarily a predator he's he's really going for more small uh smaller prey but he himself 
might be prey for something larger, right? Mm -hmm. So there's still there definitely a benefit to having that fusy form body shape in order to be very fast. But he might be using it less for catching things and more for trying to get away Whoa, from things. Oh, look at him. He is very like, impressive. Now he knows. Now he knows he's like on camera. He knows. Yeah. We're going to just complete, completely anthropomorphize here. <laughs> There he is, you see? He now, is. He's, he's, now he's doing a show. <laughs> we have lots of smaller fish in here. I think a really, so let's see. A really great let's one are these guys. some of these, um, we have, it's kind of a hodgepodge of different species here. Mm -hmm. We have, these are silver side, and we know these the silver guys. side because we've been feeding a lot of our fish today. <laughs> oh no! Silver side, we have some living silver side. Oh wow. We have, if you see any fish that have striped, small fish, those are striped killifish. And striped killifish, one good, neat thing about them is you can tell if it's a male or a female based on which direction the stripes go. Oh, really? So oh, boys, cool. stripes go up and down, vertical. Mm -hmm. And females, girls, their stripes go side to side, horizontal. So and do fish sleep? Do fish sleep? Fish do go into a, um, a resting state for sure, yeah. Okay. And one other, one, one we really need to talk about, and actually they're fighting over those fish back there, fighting oh, over it. Yep. Those, are, those guys those are, are guys. those are Mama Chug. Say Mama, it again. Mama Chug. Mama Chug. Mama Chug. And if you ever go to a, uh, pass by a creek or anything like that and you see fish in there, Mama probably Chug. you're going to see they're Mama Chug. They're very common. And their name is a uh, Native American word for going in crowds. And as you can see, that's what they <laughs> like to do. They like to be in big crowds. They can make create schools of up to several hundred. But what's really cool about Mama Chug is that little fish, that little fish right there, mm -hmm. is one of the toughest fish in the entire ocean. Interesting. One of the toughest fish there is. Why do you say that? These fish can withstand lit being in water that is near boiling. Mm. They can withstand enormous These temperature guys. ranges. They can live in water that has low oxygen. They can live in water that is fresh water all the way up to several times the amount of salt in salt water. Wow. Sea water. And in the winter when it gets cold, you know what they do? Mm. They bury themselves in the mud. This is a fish that digs. They dig themselves down into the mud and yeah. wait for it to get warmer. They can dig up to eight inches deep. So they're a really tough little fish. Um, we're getting a question about uh, little fish. Uh, we were talking about krill earlier. Is that what whales eat? Krill. Whales. Do, some whales do. Yeah. So the ba baleen whales, uh, which are some of the very largest whales, do eat krill. So, which is kind of almost strange to think about that the largest things in the ocean are eating some of the very smallest things. But they, uh, some of the very largest whales, like even the, the largest of animal of all, the blue whale, eats tiny animals like that, tiny krill. Mm. But some whales are toothed whales, and they don't eat krill, like, a, yeah. like an orca. Like an orca. Do we have any last questions about our salt marsh before we go no, into it seems our last, like It seems like we're done with the questions. Time. All right, why don't, we, why don't we move on to our last tank or last aquarium? Last tank. And there's Samantha again. Yeah. And we see Samantha again. Anywhere there's a home fish, you can find Samantha. And we'll get one more last look here. You can see what's on the menu for this one. It's actually pretty much the same food As the first from one. our first one. But you can see a little bit Ooh. smaller because uh, we don't have our fish in this tank. What is that? Guy? Those are those are the ten the tentacles. From our squid. I'm pointing at this little. So, oh, oh yeah, that's the that's the tentacles that. and part of the mm. head of our of our squid. So delicious. delicious. Absolutely. I know. And I feel like it smells sushi. even better than it looks. I promise. Sushi. You. I had sushi right, gonna, this week. We're gonna hand that over to Samantha, and she's gonna get ready. And we're Samantha's gonna take a look at our river corridor tank. River corridor. And this is another seven thousand gallon tank. Seven thousand gallons, just like our first one and this is showing the environment in the main part of the Hudson River so this is an ever-changing habitat basically from the harbor up to um, if anyone knows in upstate New York where Troy is where the Troy Dam is 
Everything north of the dam is fresh water. Everything south of the dam is a mix. And mm. the mix changes during the seasons. So this habitat is that area that's always changing. We have currents that go through here. And this is, this would be a habitat that in the spring and fall is more fresh water. But then the animals have to be ready because in the winter and the summer, it becomes more salt water. And that all has to do with the, the climate and the uh, rainfall uh, that's coming from upriver, all the snow melt that's pushing that fresh water down into the river makes it more fresh. And then during the drier months, that salt water creeps oh. pushes back up. It's like a constant tug of war between the fresh water and the salt water. So these are highly adaptable fish. And there's about 200 species of fish that can live in this part of the river. And we have several here. And oh, Whoa. here comes the food. Whoa, there's the, there's the food. There's the food. Oh, they don't, they're not as enthusiastic. Oh, there's, there's one. Sorry, there's a there's little reflection. Are, he's a black sea We're getting bass. down from the reflection, and here we go. Okay. They're black sea Yeah, they're, they're not as uh, energetic about not, food. No. They're being a little no. camera shy, I think. It's, uh, oh, oh, this one's eyeing it. This one's eyeing it. I think he's still swallowing. <laughs> 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 Come so on, guys. We there we go. In here. Uh, the it. big ones you're seeing swimming around are the striped bass. So that's these guys that's right here. That's striped bass, yeah. Oh. And the striped bass is the state is fish, the state, um, I should say, ocean or marine fish mm -hmm. for New Jersey. Oh, that's interesting. And, I didn't know and that. And friends in New York, New oh, York. There we go. Grab well. it. Grab it. No. So there's this. There's the state there, fish. There's our, our striped bass. A uh, super popular fish commercially, and of course, oh, he yeah, he it. there we go. Yeah. Okay, now they're going, now they're getting it. He's just very nonchalant about it. It's no thing. Yeah. Just eating. So we are asked, uh, why are there rocks? Why is the terrain rocks? So uh, this area that they're trying to recreate in the river has a rockier bottom, so that's why they might have those rocks there. And, Depending on where you are in the river, it can be sand, it can be mud, it can be um, rockier. Uh, we have these um, kind of faux pillars in there, maybe showing where uh, these fish, kind of showing like okay. maybe an area around the dock would be. Let me see if I can get this, these two right There's here. There's lots of different uh, kind of microhabitats oh, as you go it. through. Almost there. Oh, this, one, this one's one of my favorites. This is a pretty fish coming over here. That little guy That's there? That's a northern kingfish. That's a kingfish. Oh, wow. Northern it's a little. Kingfish. Northern kingfish are, are really neat there. So he's a uh, bottom, <laughs> bottom fish. So he's... Oh, he's is he going to grab the big piece? He's going to... I don't he's, know. I don't know. a little too big for him. He's going to have to take a bite off. No, he's yeah, taking... Oh, he's yeah. There we go. He's going for it. That's me at a buffet. And he has little, little whiskers on his chin called barbels. And he, that's what that northern kingfish uses to find his food. And he's using that oh, to sense, and actually our black drum have those too, but... So he drag, he's a bottom dweller, mm -hmm. and he likes to cruise around on the bottom using those barbels to sense for food beneath him. Uh, he's way out. Which one's this one? That is the black sea bass. Sea so these bass. are black sea bass. Really cool thing about black sea bass mm -hmm. is they, a lot of them, or most of you, potentially even most of them, change whether they're a boy or a girl throughout their lives. So most black sea bass are born as girls, and then when they get older, Interesting. they turn into boys. And the reason why is to make sure that there's always a good ratio of boys and girls in the population so that they can always make sure that there are uh, enough of them for spawning. So he, uh, he is a uh, definitely an adult. This is a about as big as they get, maybe a little bit bigger, but he's just about full grown for a black sea bass. Wow, he is, I mean, that is incredible. I did not know that. Of a, in, a color of a, of a boy. But I did a, not probably, get that. That's cool. Because that's, if you came here to the Science Center a few years ago, you may have seen that fish, except it was a girl. That's mind blowing. Mind's blown. Blown. <laughs> Mind blow, okay. Yep. And we've got our striped, striped bass, very popular fish. Um, very heavily regulated fish now, too, because their numbers have declined from overfishing. 
And they're, they've got that very oh. clear torpedo shape. Does anyone at home remember what the torpedo shape is called? If you're a body, if you're a fisherman, your body's shaped like a torpedo, we'll give everyone 30 seconds to get that in. But he's definitely a predatory fish, and he also has some, an organ called a lateral line yeah. along his body that he uses to help sense uh, danger and uh, also prey around him. That's very cool. Give everyone a hint that body shape starts with the letter F. It's the body shape that starts with the letter F. Um, still waiting. We give still everyone waiting. a second there. We know we've got a lag. We're a little bit of a lag, yeah. A little bit of a lag here. Are we getting any questions? Uh, so far, it is the fact that why did the first tank have so many fish and why does this tank have so less fish? So the, now, some of our, this tank is actually built into the wall a little bit, so some of our fish could Fuji potentially form. even be hiding back there a little bit. We might have one or two back there. But we, uh, we change, the, the fish are constantly changing, where, which tanks they're in. They might graduate to a bigger one. Uh, this is just the number of fish we have in here right now. There's no reason why we won't have more fish in here in the future. This is just, as it is right now, the number of fish we have. Uh, things are a little unusual, uh, as everyone knows, in the world right now, so uh, we're not looking to bring in any new fish, I don't think, in the immediate future, but certainly this, this tank has at times way more fish than it does right now. So people are getting it right. Um... Jessica, Jan, and Nika said Fusi form. Fusi form, good yep. job, guys. We got like Great a job. Fuji form as well, but that's So we started close. our day off with a macaw. We're finishing our day here with some Fusi form body shaped striped bass. Nice. And this, and the, uh, I got this one. Wait, I got this one. This is the. We're testing the pesh now. Uh, I was, there's I actually, only two fish in here. There's only two fish in here. The one that's got the striped bass. <laughs> the kingfish is the small one. Yeah, we had the little northern kingfish. And this guy here, he is our black sea bass. Black sea, black sea bass. Black sea bass. Very cool. There he fish. is. Yes, it is the black sea bass. Yeah, they're correcting me on the I'm glad. Thank you, everybody else, for paying attention at home. I'm glad you're all paying attention. Uh, apparently, my uh, producer cameraman extraordinaire <laughs> here is uh, is not, but I'm glad everyone else is. It's uh, funny. But all right, everybody, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, as always, for joining us. We will be back 11 a.m. next Wednesday. We're going to go back downstairs to go visit um, some of our land-based animals again. So tune in to see uh, who you get to see or whoever we're going to be checking out next week. Also. Um, my hair's getting completely out of control, and I think I'm gonna try and cut it myself this weekend. Yes! So tune in next week to see how horrible a job I do on that. That, that will be great. awesome. That might be the best part of the whole thing next I think week. so. I As think so. As always, everybody, I know anyone who's in the tri state area like we are, uh, things look like they're finally starting to get a little bit better. However, please, please, please continue to socially distance, continue to stay at home when you can. Uh, now is not the time to let up. We want to make sure that once we get this thing down, we keep it down. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we cannot wait to see you again next week. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.